Jared Adams is here. Steve Adams. Del Vante. Richard Baker. Stanley Becker. Joseph Sandrowski. Mike DiCarlo. Michael DiCarlo. Mark Kirshner. Justin Mesker. Jessica Rosario. William Silvestro. Angela Skinner. Candace Traster. Jason White. Here. Kyle Winkleman. Yeah. And Jaden. All right. We're going to continue on um, and spend a minute reviewing what we talked about last time. And then we're going to get specific into the tools that we're going to be using in this course. All right. So far we've been talking about server-side code, server-side scripting um, conceptually. The explanation that I gave on Tuesday, the basic model of how that works would apply whether you're talking about ASP.NET or PHP or Perl or any number of server-side scripting uh, languages. It's a basic concept. I want to spend a bit of time talking about client-side scripting because that's the other part of the equation of what makes for a typical website. And then we're going to get into the specifics of the ASP.NET technology. So, I had this diagram up on the board last time. A diagram I'll probably repeat, and if you take multiple classes from me, you will take it, you'll see it multiple times. Where we have the client. who is connected to the internet. Represented as a cloud because we don't care about the details of how it gets from the client to the server, we just know that it does. This is typically someone with a device, whether it be a computer or a mobile device, running a web browser software, connected to the internet, and making requests to the web server. Remember, a client makes requests
And by a web page, I mean it returns back typically a combination of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's the general model, whether you're talking about static or dynamic pages. All right? In general, this is what happens. Only difference being is in the case of static pages, the pages are already complete. And the server simply grabs them and delivers them. All right? Simply takes them. Someone completed those HTML pages, and they're sitting out there waiting, and they're delivered to the client as is. So these will be the kind of pages that you did in CISS 216, the intro to web development. Dynamic pages are a little more involved. Dynamic pages typically involve some sort of scripting, programming, and the pages are not completed pages, but they're instructions of how to create a web page. Those instructions get executed by the server, and the server can interact with other stuff. Specifically, a web server, I'm sorry, a database server. The script does its thing, it processes it. And the output, though, is still a web page because that's what browsers consume, right? That's what browsers need. They need a web page. They don't understand server side scripting, they understand web pages. So this is what we had talked about last time. Are there any questions about this? Where ASP.NET comes in is it's one of the ways that these dynamic instructions, recipes for web pages, and so on. It's one of the languages that these can be written in, one of the platforms that it can be executed. Now, there's two little catches to this, two additional things. I, I don't know. I said catches. They're not really catches, but two additional features that I want to talk about. One is, is that at some point, people recognize that there's a computer typically at this end and at this end. And therefore, this computer can execute instructions too. So they can be scripting on this end, too. All right? That's typically called client-side scripting, because it's on the client side. And typically is done in JavaScript. There's a difference, though, between the scripting that happens on the server side and the scripting that happens on the client side. What are some thoughts that you might have? What's, what's the difference? What does client-side scripting do, and what's the advantage of client-side scripting as compared to server-side scripting? Doesn't need to send a request. Doesn't need to send a request. That's the primary advantage of it. Processing can be done without sending information through the internet, hitting the web server, the web server doing its thing, and returning back an answer. All right? Code can be executed right on the client that can do relatively simple manipulations to the page. All right? If I were to describe the difference, the server side typically does the heavy lifting. Please. Sometimes have a radio. 
radio show here uh, on Boom Radio uh, at LC. It's always hard to remember how many C's to say, like when you're doing a mouse button. This is Mike on Boom Radio, LCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCC
I could get what I see here along with that little window that says here are some re uh, uh, suggested requests. When I put my mouse in them in there, it could trigger some JavaScript to show those requests. So that, or the show that part of the response rather, uh, these these search queries. This part of it is sort of explainable using the standard client server model, right? I requested a page. The page was stuff that I saw, stuff that I didn't see. There's JavaScript in there that shows a piece of the hidden web page. But what you can't really explain easily with the standard client server model is how the predictive search works. So I type in H and I see all of the most common search terms, not all, I should rephrase that. I see the top 10, it looks like, search terms that begin with H. All right. Now let's think about that. Could this have been sent as part of the original request? Ooh, not likely, right? Because first of all, I guess it could, but it would have to send 26 of these, right? Probably more when you include numbers, right? So it would have to show the top 10 searches for like anything that you could type in. And that doesn't seem terribly realistic. And the more you type, the less realistic it gets. So for example, if I type in HT, it shows me the top most common searches for things that begin with HT. So how many two letter combinations are there? A lot. Three letter, a lot more. Four letter, a lot more, and so on. So it seems unlikely that all of these hidden things got sent to the browser as part of the initial request and response cycle. What seems to be happening is that, and, and secondly, it doesn't appear that the entire page is being refreshed. Just this section here is being refreshed. I don't see any flicker on the Google logo. I don't see anything moving down here. So this web page is being changed without getting back a brand new copy of the web page. So that sounds like client side. Yet it's clearly doing an inquiry to a database to get the most popular search options. All right. And therefore, it seems like it's doing server side database inquiries. So the truth is, is that's the case. It's actually doing both. It's just doing it in a slightly different manner that's called Ajax. With Ajax, you make a different kind of request to the web page. So if I type in HU, notice that one of the most popular searches is Hurricane Dorian, which is like the current hurricane. In other words, this, this is up to date, right? This isn't just some generic list of things. So it's really doing a database search to determine the 10 most popular search terms that start with those letters. So what's happening is this. Every time I press a key, I make a query to the server. I make a request to the server. But I make a different kind of request. I don't make a request for a completed web page. I make a request for a piece of data. So the official terminology for these things is that this kind of request that I talked about before is an HTTP request. The kind of request that only asks for a piece of data is going to be an XML HTTP request. So it's a different kind of request. It's going to contain the same things in it, but it's asking for something else. It's not asking for a completed web page. It's asking for a 
piece of data. That data comes back. It might be an XML. This is where XML HTTP is kind of named a little goofy because it doesn't have to be XML, but oftentimes it is. The server sends back not a complete web page. It sends back some data. That data goes back to the client, and there is JavaScript that formats that data. So what we saw with the predictive text on Google is still fits in the client-server model, but it's accomplished via a different kind of request. All right, It's accomplished via a XML HTTP request, which sends back a piece of data, which gets formatted by the client-side code, and it redisplays the current page without having to refresh the entire page. Okay, your Facebook feed would be would have Ajax in it, right? Because if someone posts a new post and you're looking at your uh, timeline, that new post is going to appear, right? Without you having to hit refresh. Or Gmail, if you log into Gmail and someone sends you an email in the middle of it, that appears without you having to do anything. So. It's not making a request for a brand new web page. It's not refreshing your entire web page. It's just adding to the web page that's already there. All right. The photo, now, we may get into a little bit of Ajax, some client-side scripting, but this is the focus of what we're going to talk about, the, the server-side scripting, the heavy lifting of these dynamic websites. And the particular tool we're going to use is ASP.NET. ASP stands for Active Server Pages. .NET is a series of technology that Microsoft introduced the mid-2000s, maybe? I, I don't remember the exact year. ASP.NET contains a couple of things. Contains a framework. And it allows language support for at least a couple of languages, C Sharp and VB.NET. We're going to be doing C Sharp. What does a framework mean? What, what do you think of when you think of framework? Like a, like a library for tools? A library? Tools? All right, that's a good definition. What's the goal of a framework? What does what is the goal of a, of having a framework? What's the advantage of having a framework? It saves time. Pardon me. It saves time. It saves time, right? It's sort of a starting point for you to build your application on. There are certain things that happen in every web application. If you had to write code to handle every one of those things, it would be an overwhelming task. So they've done some work for you. If you provided you some tools, some objects, some classes that you could use to build upon, so you're not building everything from the ground up. All right. So that's in a nutshell what a framework is. C sharp, as you all know, is a programming language. It's different than HTML. HTML sort of defines a document structure, whereas C sharp is a full blown programming language, object oriented instructions, if statements, syntax, and so on down the line. Now there's a few flavors of ASP.NET. We'll forget ASP.NET's ancestor, which is just plain old ASP, sometimes called classic ASP. This is the language I first learned when I started doing dynamic web pages. This was like late 90s. All right. 
Initially, ASP.NET used things called web forms. And that actually was a good technology, much better than the original or classic ASP. But there were still some issues with it. And you know that technology companies need to continue to evolve and improve the tools that they provide and so on. Web forms is actually the, the style of ASP I taught up through last spring semester. All right? So you guys are like moving into newer grounds for me too. All right? I'm still in the process of familiarizing myself with the new flavor of ASP. Uh, dot net. Another flavor of ASP is MVC. And that stands for Model View Controller. I know you all have had at least a C sharp programming class, I believe, anyhow. And you probably know that one big advantage that you have when you're creating software is if you break things down to specific little pieces that only handle one thing. Well, that's what Model View Controller does. It's a model uh, or it's a, it's a template for programming that gives um, specific roles to the different classes that you create. One of them does the view. That's the user interface. One of them does the model. That's like where the data comes from and how the data is used. And the other is the controller, which is sort of the go-between between the data or the model and the view. All right? I went back and forth in my mind deciding which one to teach in this class. I decided to go to option number three. And that is using razor pages. Now this is a little confusing because razor pages are also used in model view control model. But this in a way is a bit of a simplification of model view controller. So I think it will be a good point for us to start off learning. Uh, this new technology will be with razor pages. My hope is if you get razor pages down, it's not that big of a leap for you to understand Models View Controller. All right. Typically, if you go to a company that's using ASP.NET, they could be taking any of these approaches. That makes it hard to teach, right? Because how do I know what they're going to take? Uh, that's kind of why I went with this. In a way, it sort of seems in the middle between ASP.NET, Web Forms, and Model View con Controller. Your first assignment is to write a page, create a web page or web pages that uh, do some research about these topics and create a page that summarizes what they're about and explains them in more detail. So I won't go into more detail about this because that's part of your assignment. What I want to do today, though, is I want to take a glance at, we're going to create a sample application using Visual Studio. All right? And Visual Studio is the IDE, which is typically used with ASP.NET. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. It's just a set of tools that helps you do your job as a software developer a lot easier. You could create an ASP.NET application using Notepad if you wanted to. But if you did, it would be tough. Good luck. All right. ASP.NET is a set of tools that makes that job a lot easier and does some of the work for you and allows you to concentrate on the uh, appropriate. fall under the category of ASP.NET Core. And one nice thing with this is this is open source and it's cross-platform. 
I was actually writing ASP pages on my Mac yesterday, which was like unthinkable, like in the prior generation. All right, so what I'm going to do is we're going to create a sample application using Visual Studio, which is the IDE. So let's, let's make sure we use these terms correctly because sometimes a student will say, well, Visual Studio is doing this. Well, no, Visual Studio isn't doing that. The C-sharp language is doing that. Visual Studio is the tool used to create these applications. C-sharp is a programming language which we're going to use. And ASP.NET is sort of the framework, the set of building blocks that we're going to use in creating our applications. So let's go in here, and I'm going to create an application. And then we're just going to spend a few minutes looking at the pieces of the application. And then we might make some changes to it. So let me find Visual Studio. To do this, you need Visual Studio, I believe, 2017 or newer, 2016 or newer. This is Visual Studio 2019, which is in the lab. All right. So I'm going to go up here and say File, New. Am I enjoying Visual Studio? I'm having the time of my life. File, New, Project. You have a choice of the kinds of project you're going to develop. A cancel app. Uh, what are some of these? I think there's mobile apps down here. I guess it depends on how it's installed. We're going to pick ASP.NET Core Web Application. Notice there's even some other options, single page applications. So I click on that. It gives me the name of the project, where it wants to put it, and the name of the solution associated with the project. I'm going to just put it on the old desktop so it's easy to find when I go in and upload this to Canvas. I click Create. I get prompted. All right. with choices of the kinds of applications that you want to create. The three that I want to talk about are empty. That's where it creates an application with nothing in it other than some control files. It's interesting. Even an empty application it creates for you, there's stuff in it. All right. A web application which is the one we're going to use because we're going to be using Razor Pages. And then finally, a web application using the Model View Controller model, which we are not doing, at least not yet. Possibly we'll look at an example before the end of the semester. Well, we're also not doing right now the APIs, which we, again, we might do uh, at a later point. So we're going to pick web application. All right, and I'm going to create, click create, and it goes and does its thing. It's going to create a, pay, uh, a site that has several sample pages on it, and we'll take a look at it, and, as well as a folder, and so on. Now, if we go out and look on the disk, here's a folder. If we look inside of it, there's a lot of stuff. There's a bin, object, pages, properties, WW root, as well as these other sort of control files. If 
I were to close out of Visual Studio, I want to get back in. I could do that simply by double clicking the solution. Now we're going to look at some of these files. Some of them we're not really going to pay attention to now, and some of them we will pay attention to now. Dependencies we're not going to worry about right now. Properties we're not going to worry about right now, but we can kind of figure out what it does. Launch settings. Well, that explains what's going to happen when this program launches. If we look at here, it's in a JSON format. JSON is a format of storing data. This simply says sort of what happens when this application starts. WW root. This is where we're going to put a number of things. We're going to put our CSS in here. We're going to put our images in here. We're going to put our JavaScript in here. We're going to put other libraries in here that we're using. Notice it already has built in jQuery for you if you want to use jQuery on your page. It already gives you a default CSS file. Gives you default images and gives you some default JavaScript or at least a place to put your default JavaScript. I don't think there's anything in that script file. There isn't. <laughs> but it gives you a place to put it. All right. This is sort of an aspect of the framework uh, and, and the word that I've seen a lot written is, is scaffolding. In other words, they give you something to build on top of. Now, notice that there aren't any pages in here. The pages are actually in this folder called pages. All right. And it's interesting that that doesn't appear in the WW root folder. It appears in the pages folder because these are server side scripting pages. These are razor pages. These are pages that get translated into HTML. These are dynamic pages, pages that have HTML in them, has some client-side code, and it has some server-side instructions in them too that you can use to create HTML pages. But again, notice they're not in the WW root. You'd only put the purely static pages in WW root. Here's an app setting. Here is other control files that, that deal with when the application starts up. We're going to spend most of our time looking at the CS HTML. It stands for client side and HTML. Before we do that though, let's run this. Let's see what the sample application gives us. I clicked the little debug button up here to run it. It's going to go and do its thing and it's going to bring up the results in a web browser. Okay, do I want to trust, we're in development, we're going to say yes. Yes, I want to install the certificate. It does its thing and it brings up our web page. So that's the web page that it generated for us. Pretty good, huh? Oh, look at that little carousel up there. Nice. Now, notice up here that there is 
I believe the European Union uh, requires all websites to give a statement about the cookies that they maintain. So I think they built that into the framework. This little message that says, do you accept the cookie policy? And you could click learn more to learn more about the cookie policy, or you can, you can click accept. When you click accept, that little message goes away and you have your navigation on the top. Web application one, home, about, and contact. This is the home page, it's the about page, it's the contact page, and so on. So there are four pages in here. Three pages. Both those go to the same place. And in addition, there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's an about and a contact. Okay, let's look at how these pages are constructed. Because, and this sometimes is a maddening thing, right? It takes a whole lot of pages, takes a whole lot of files just to generate those three pages, right? Because look, here we have the about page. Here we have the contact page. Here we have the index page. So those are the three main pages. There's an error page, which we didn't get because we didn't run into any errors. And there's a privacy page that when you click on, uh, it pops up. When you click on the cookie page, it pops up. Now let's look, for example, at the contact page. Remember what the contact page looked like. Contact, your contact page gives you Microsoft's address and copyright information and a couple of email addresses. All right? Along with the navigation on the top of the page. All right? So let's look at the CSHTML page relating to that. That sure doesn't look like a complete web page, does it? All right. We have this stuff up here, which is server-side code. We'll talk about it in a few minutes here, but just know for now that that's server-side code. And we got some HTML mixed with some of these weird at things. All right, which again is also server-side code. When you see the at sign in front of something, it's server-side code. The bottom line is I don't see all the HTML that appeared when I went to the contact page. So where is it? Well, one observation when you do a website, typically there's a portion of that website that stays the same regardless of what page you're on, right? Uh, if you go to, I don't know why I always go to ESPN, I'm not even that big of a sports fan. Probably because it's, it's not really that controversial compared to like if I went to a news site. As I navigate around, Notice that stuff stays the same. The footer down here. Oh, I can't even get to the footer. All right. The point is, is that big portions of the page stay the same as I go from page to page. If I go to LorraineCCC.edu, as I go around from page to page, the top part stays the same, the bottom part stays the same, and just the middle section changes. All right? That's very common that a web page is going to have, a website rather, is going to have certain sections of the page 
that are identical or virtually identical on every page. That code is actually put in a separate file, the common code. And that file is under shared and it's called layout underscore layout CSHTML. So if we look at that page, we see the whole HTML file. There's the HTML document, there's, uh, or the dot type, there's HTML, there's the head. The title is coming from a little snippet of server-side code so that we can change it for each page. We have our navigation bar. Here's our links. You know, it's a good idea to have your links constant from page to page. Ah, render body. That's where the details of the specific page that we're viewing get inserted. So again, at render body is a server side command that says put in this spot the code for the specific page. This layout page is a sort of generic template for your web pages and on each specific web page you fill in that middle section where it says render body with the details of the web page. Now you'll notice a couple places in here it has these environment tags. An environment tag allows you to have your app behave a little bit different whether you're in development mode or production mode. There's a lot of reasons why you might want to do that. Okay? So a lot of reasons why you want may want your page to act different in development mode than production mode. For one thing, if you're using a database, you'd want to use a test database when you're in development mode. And you might want to and you'd use a real database when you're in production mode. But there's other subtle things, too, that are different when you're developing a, uh, an application versus when you're actually running it. And this environment tag allows you to customize the page depending on whether you're testing it or actually running it. So how does a web page get put together? When I request contact CSHTML, or when I request the contact page, it finds contact.cshtml, it finds the layout page, it displays the layout page, and where it says render body is where it puts in the code specific for the CSHTML page. So let's, let's look at that. Let's go to the contact page. Let's do a view source. Remember, now we're seeing what the client gets delivered. We're in the browser. So if I say a view source, I'm going to copy and paste this into a notepad document. this now. This is the HTML that got sent to the client. Let's see where it came from. Well, the first part of it comes from the layout file. Doctype HTML, doctype HTML, HTML, HTML. 
Medic Charset, UTF-80, and so on down the line. We are in development mode, therefore it used these two links for style sheets, not the production mode. There's the end head, there's the body, there's the navigation, and so on down the line. So everything up until this container body content is coming from the layout CSHTML file. When we get to that point, though, it inserts the contents of the contact CSHTML file. This code right here came from this right here. Okay? So the layout says, hey, put the specifics for this page at this point. Remember, this layout is used for every page. At least in this application, it's used for every page. So the only part that changes when we go from page to page to page is this stuff. And that gets filled in with the details of the specific page that we requested. Because we requested contact, it gets filled in with this piece of data. All right. What do you suppose will happen if I get rid of this line? I got rid of render body in the layout file. Exactly. Every page I go to is going to look kind of like the generic layout, except that it's not going to have the specific information for each page. So if I go and run this, actually gave me an error because I violated one of the rules. If I want to ignore the body, I should say ignore body. Interesting. I didn't realize that. Let's do that then. So if I say ignore body, then it will do what I described. And it will show me only the layout page. See, the framework's smart. Framework doesn't let you do things that doesn't make sense to it. In this case, it doesn't make sense hmm. Well, let's not play with this. It doesn't make sense It doesn't make sense to have a layout for which you're not displaying the specifics of the page. How do we change the way the contact? Let's say I want to put my information in the contact page instead. Well, I don't have to change the layout at all. All right. I could go into this contact and I could change it to be whatever I want. So I could say... I swear that should be the contact page for many organizations that I've dealt with. They make it so hard to get a hold of them. All right, let's run this. Contact, none, go away, don't bother us. Now notice what this says here. We're saying view data title equals contact. All right, 
at view data title equals contact. Then we're saying at here, we're putting view data title. So it's putting that word, whatever word I put there, it's putting there, and it's also putting in the title bar of the page. So if I go to contact, notice the title says contact, and it says contact here. All right, that's because this variable, or this array actually, view data title says put that in the title of the page and put that as a header here. What if we change that to go away? Then when we run it, that will get put here and that will get put in the title. How do I know it will get put in the title? Well, let's look at the title of the layout. It says use the variable view title. Or, I'm sorry, use the variable title that's part of view data. So this is a way for us to guarantee consistency. That way this makes sure that the top level heading or the heading on the page matches the title of the page, which is a very good thing to do. All right? We could define other data too, all right, if we wanted to. And we could use that and share that between the layout and the specific pages. Our go away page, the title of it is go away. What if we want to add a page? How do we do that? Let's say we add a directions page. All right. I'm going to right mouse on pages, say add, and I'm going to pick a razor page. I'm just going to click up pick a plain old razor page. What name? I'll call it directions. Use a layout page. What layout page? This one. We can have multiple layout pages, right? Because if you go to a website, I mentioned that there's consistency between the pages. But consistency doesn't mean that every page has the exact same layout. There might be some pages that have a slightly different layout than others. Well, you can have multiple layout pages. Here's our directions page. And we can put whatever the directions are. Okay. Now, I'm going to run this. And we're not going to see it on the menu. Why not? What do we need to change in addition to that? What do you suppose we need to change in addition to that? In the layout page. So if we go here and look, yep, there's our navigation. And our navigation, even though we added a page, and that makes sense. Just because you add a page doesn't mean it's going to be on the main navigation. So if you want it on the navigation, you'll copy it, paste it, 
and I'm going to say directions. And notice it's not directions.cshtml. It's just slash directions. The configuration file knows that when you ask for that directions to go in the pages folder and get the directions cshtml file. Now it's up there, we click on it, there's our page. Okay, I think that's enough for today. Uh, what I will plan on doing next time is maybe make a little simple web application. Now that we've taken a tour of the files that get created and have some understanding on how these Razor pages work. So we'll, we'll create a simple application and, uh, and go from there next time. Practice this. Do exactly what I did in lab if you have finished your other assignment. All right. That's all I had. I will go unlock lab. I'll come back for my files. And then I'll be back in lab.